You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today is Roman Yambolsky of the University of Louisville. Roman, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Hey, how you doing? So, uh, I'm doing great, thanks. So, our topic for today is uh, artificial intelligence and uh, specifically the safety of artificial intelligence, AI safety. It's become sort of a hot topic in recent years. Quite quickly, actually, something that none of us had ever, most people had never thought about or heard about until recently. So, Roman, give me some background. Um, when did people start becoming concerned that uh, that AI is something other than just you know the, a new technology, not not different from you know a new a new widget or a new type of assembly line or, or any other kind of new technology since, well, I, I guess since the Industrial Revolution? Well, it depends on what you want to consider as concern. Some people wrote about it as early as 1800s. Hmm. Concerns about automation, job displacement. So it's not completely novel. If you're willing to admit uh, science fiction as evidence, there is definitely a lot of... Uh, Concern with that uh, going back 50, 60 years. But uh, specifically in computer science community, it's probably about five years ago where a large number of people went, you know, we're making excellent progress. What happens when we succeed? Yeah. And um, it, it, the, the interesting thing about AI and about AI safety is just how, uh, I guess, how, how fantastic it, it can it can seem at first, but then how totally reasonable it uh, it is to be concerned about these kind of things. Uh, when when you think about uh, the way some people think about it, it's not unlike uh, you know the human ancestors, you know, thing uh, chimpanzees, uh, and and should they be concerned about something much more intelligent than them? emerging and the answer of course with the benefit of hindsight is yes they you know you you should be very concerned about something smarter than you uh existing and maybe not sharing your goals so so tell me what what are some of the big issues uh in in AI what what are some of the topics that that people are are most uh concerned and about and interested in so a lot of people worry about existing technology, right? We already have some intelligent systems and they have problems. They can be biased. They can have bugs in them. So a lot of people look at uh, what we have today and how can we make it better? How can we make self-driving cars which don't kill pedestrians? How we can make systems making hiring decisions don't discriminate and so on. But then people also look at what happens in five years if we continue developing at this rate, 10 years, 15 years. At some point, we're going to get to human level performance. Quickly after, we're going to get to superhuman performance. Will the same problems become just kind of worse? Will new problems appear? That's where a lot of my research is uh, trying to understand future problems, predict the type of AI failures we can anticipate by studying existing problems, previous problems, and kind of projecting this trend forward. Mm -hmm. So right now, AIs, uh, they, they do things like beat humans at chess. They steer cars, but only in sort of confined experimental settings. But we're, we expect that to expand rapidly. It, it seems, though, that right now, AIs are very limited they they do one thing uh, maybe they do it really well maybe they do it not so well tell me about the idea of a a general artificial intelligence uh what at you know if i'm looking at an ai how do i know if it's a general ai well every ai we have today is narrow ai we don't have general intelligence so that's easy for you to tell <laughs> uh the hope is that one day a system will be able to transfer knowledge between domains 
So just because it learned to play chess, it can be much better at checkers by reusing some of the heuristics it discovered. And uh, that's what humans do a lot of times. We master a skill and then we are able to apply it in new domains, new situations, and so we become better over time at multiple domains. Uh, this is something we're trying to get those systems to learn, but we only had partial success with that so far. Mm. So far, there are some AIs that can do more than one thing. Just uh, you know, but it's they're still narrow in the sense that the more than one thing might be just so. Alpha Zero, I believe, can play more than one game, but those games are limited to two-player abstract games with perfect information i i believe right and they kind of separately trained most of the time we're just now starting to create systems which uh, learn on multiple domains and integrate information between them but typically it was yeah i have a checkers playing program and a chess playing program and if i put it on the same pc i can claim it does two things but they're really not connected uh, in any meaningful way whereas the hope is to integrate knowledge from existing domains as you study new domains. And we're starting to do a little bit of that just now. Yeah. So uh, w- where do you see artificial intelligence going over the next, you know, uh, well, I mean, pick pick a time frame. Um, we, we probably won't have, well, w- we, what happens with a lot of technologies is they they ramp up and then they very rapidly uh, advance once they once they break through some of the important bottlenecks. So, so how fast do you see AI improving over the next decade and over the next maybe five decades or maybe even over the next century? So it's an exponential technology. Like most digital technologies, it's kind of doubling in capacity after a certain time interval. And I think we're getting to the point where the doubling interval is increasing, uh, decreasing rapidly in terms of time. So Nobody knows for sure, but it seems like we're getting close to to a major breakthrough. We have finally sufficient hardware, sufficient data to to do things we couldn't do 50 years ago, even if we had the right algorithms. So without stating exact dates, uh, I think in our lifetimes, we all going to have to deal with uh, systems smarter than us. Okay. And... and uh... Yeah, and I mean, you mentioned before that we're going to reach human-level intelligence and then rapidly reach superhuman intelligence. And that makes a lot of sense because, you know, already at the point when you create a human-level AI, it's going to have the powers that humans don't currently have. For instance, a calculator. A human can't multiply together two eight-digit numbers in a split section, second, but a computer very easily can. Right. Huge memory, speed, access to internet, ability to communicate instantly, a lot of superpowers. So a lot of people are concerned about this. We, we mentioned some of the more immediate concerns, getting our, our AI systems to hire without discriminating or you know, not hit pedestrians when they're in cars. But then there's the more long-term concerns that a- AI could be an existential risk to humanity. And you, you have some papers on uh, the notion of wireheading. Um, so what, well, first, what is wireheading and what would it mean for an AI to, to wirehead? So humans are likely to engage in behaviors which are not very productive, but pleasant. We just kind of try to get reward directly without doing useful work. Uh, Watching television or maybe watching pornography is a great example. Certainly does nothing for reproductive success, but seems to directly stimulate proper parts of the brain. Uh, It seems that uh, certain AI systems modeled in this architecture will be able to do the same thing, where instead of doing what they should be doing, uh, doing productive work for us, for example, they can get direct access to the reward channel. And the danger from that is that if you are the one controlling this reward channel, then the system has incentive to take over you, control you directly. Right, right. So, I mean, the I've seen examples of, uh, of experiments where they 
they literally put a wire in in usually not a human's head, but a, like a rat's head and stimulate the ple- pleasure centers of, of its brain very, very directly. And just the, the rat just stops caring about anything else, right? They, they just want more current to those to, in that wire. Right. That's the original experiment. That's the name for it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so you could think of an AI then having a utility function you know, defined by us, you know, humans say, okay, AI, I want you to do this, this, and this, and uh, your utility function is a weighted average of those three goals. And then a wireheading AI would be one that maybe, maybe it just hacks into the scoring function and sets those numbers arbitrarily high. And then, and then maybe it just goes and tries to find more RAM to set the numbers even higher because. Uh, it's at the limit of how big a number it can store. Um, and, and so what, what's that notion you talked about of if you are part of its utility function? So, so what kind of problems could that create for an AI trying to wirehead itself? So if you decide in the reward to assign to the system, it's easier to hack you, hack your brain, blackmail you do something else than to actually do difficult work to satisfy you and there are really no limits to what can be done to take over a specific person ideally you'll get bribed or something nice but you can be tortured into providing high reward channel right so maybe i want to maintain i build an ai and i want to maintain uh some control over it so i its reward then is you know, a lever I can pull or a dial I can twist to, to, uh, to say, you know, you're doing well, AI, right? And so, oh, you can just say it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I could just say to the AI, "Good job, AI." And uh, you know, if that's in its reward function, it'll want me to say "Good job," but it won't necessarily want me to say it, uh, really meaning it. It might not care if I'm saying "Good job" because it did a good job or because it you know, took my family hostage and and forced me to say good job all the time. Right. So that's a simple example. There are infinitely many ways you can accomplish something like that and backdoors for for hacking this. Uh, We see examples from evolutionary computation where a system is evolving to satisfy some utility function, but it finds an interesting variant where it does absolutely nothing good, but gets very high score for it. Okay. So, uh, Many people are skeptical about the dangers of AI. I think Neil deGrasse Tyson said, you know, if an AI got out of control, he'd just unplug it or, or, or something like that. So why should people be worried that an AI might uh, get beyond what humans can, you know, get beyond humans' ability to control it and, and constrain it? So if you don't like a computer virus, just shut it off. Does that make any sense whatsoever? And this is intelligent software at current level. What happens then? The virus is smarter than you. Right. So you'd have to, right, you can shut off your entire computer, but that's that's throwing away a lot of value just to get rid of a, a virus. Well, short of shutting down the whole infrastructure we rely on, you can't really do anything with an infected internet and cyber infrastructure. Right. So, so we have, if once we have AIs driving all our cars and, uh, you know, making all our hiring decisions or some of a large portion of them, uh, you know, we, we already have, uh, computer algorithms, uh, doing high frequency trading and, and deciding where, where capital is going to be allocated. If th- those AIs, if some of them became problematic, it would be hard to uh, dial back the clock. You know, we can't we can't go back to. It's impossible at this mm-hmm. point already. We surrendered so much control to just not intelligent, but just software. Uh, at this point, there is simply no way a person or multiple people can handle that level of complexity. Controlling, as you said, stock market, power plants, electrical grid, uh, airline uh, industry. I mean, it's just beyond what we can take over manually. Okay, so I mean, there's there's a lot of kind of uh, dire warnings from AI safety 
researchers and such, but uh, are, are there, su- supposing we, we want to keep ourselves relatively safe and, and avoid those sort of tail risks where, you know, catastrophic risks from putting more, more trust in AI, have there been some proposed solutions, uh, you know, whether they've panned out or not uh, to, to the AI safety problem? Well, there are very high-level abstract proposals, and there are very specific solutions to tiny niche problems. But as of today, we don't have a solution or even a prototype for something which might work in the future. That's why research is so important right now. Hmm. So, so tell me about some of those, uh, some of those niche solutions. Uh, you know, what what are what are sort of the? I I assume that th- they might give us some hints of of. Uh, of solutions to to other things, or at least the pattern of of what a solution might look like. So you brought up example of shutting it off. Uh, how can we design a system which doesn't mind being shut off? Works with you, collaborates. It thinks you know better. Maybe it needs to be updated, upgraded. Uh, so how can we make it where its utility function does not penalize being turned off and not being able to earn more utility? Okay. So I mean we I think we both mentioned utility functions um and of course you know as an economist I I recognize utility functions as something that comes out of our 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 models and our our terminology but we're usually trying to use them to model human behavior and we've mostly found that a lot of human behavior doesn't seem to adhere to you, any any reasonable utility function uh, any sort of well-defined, smooth, curving uh, utility function that we see in our models. But in AI, uh, the utility functions are much more literal, where the, the system is literally built with, with an explicit, often, utility function. Um, so how, how, did, uh, how did that idea from economics get into, get into AI? It makes a lot of sense in a narrow domain, right? Let's say you're playing a game. You want as many points as possible. It's a single number and you're maximizing it. This works really well. And if you had a human being in a narrow domain trying to maximize some value, they would have a pretty rational utility function. The problems start when you have to figure out how to do multivariate optimization. You have hundreds of things you want. Some are essential, some are optional, some are random. What is the utility function there? You said correctly, humans don't have a well-specified utility function. I can just write down for myself even. Uh, Once we have AIs which are operating in the real world and as smart as us and try to accomplish as many different goals, their utility functions will also stop being so simple, trivial, linear. Mm. So one one objection I've heard is that uh, um, anything smart enough if if it's as smart as we are then really it should also be uh, morally upstanding or it, it should uh, it should recognize the value of of life or or something like that we we tend to see empathy as part of being a human level intelligence explain why why that intuition is is not correct does it actually work in humans are we <laughs> ethical uh, some would say yes well, it's crazy if you just look at the actual data. I mean, we are psychopaths. <laughs> Murder, rape, torture. I mean, what what is it we don't do? Yeah. Well, we uh, w- one could one could argue that you know the average person is fairly moral most of the time. I suppose. Again, but... I see no historical evidence for such <laughs> claims. Yeah. Okay. And and so and so with an with an AI though, there's there's the idea that they're not only could they be immoral from our perspective, they could be totally amoral, or they could have a, uh, you know, they they could have goals that are totally orthogonal to things that we think are are good and bad. There's the idea of a paperclip maximizer, right? So they can have completely different set of values and goals. Uh, pretty much anything could go. We call them values, but they're not really valuable. Whatever we grow up with is what we cherish. And likewise, whatever we design those systems with is what they're going to consider important. Right. So 
how how big would you say is the uh, AI safety research movement, and and what kind of directions are are they uh, are they trying to go towards a, a greater theory of AI safety? So it's a very new field, as I said. Maybe five years is fair estimate on how long it's been, where it had more than one or two people working on it. And uh, it's still tiny. If you guess that there is, I don't know, 100,000 people developing AI, there is maybe, you know, a couple dozen people working on AI safety full time. Most of them are not computer scientists. You have a lot of philosophers, economics professors, uh, just really diverse uh, backgrounds. So it's just starting. We're just trying to figure out what the problems are, what the possible solutions are. Can we solve this? Uh, so it's very early on. It's like we just discovered computers and we're figuring out what can we do with them. Mm. I, I've I've heard though that um, that AI safety has been endorsed by you know a lot of very prominent people, uh, Peter Thiel and Elon Musk and uh, maybe Bill Gates, uh, but uh, a lot of yes, people who yes. ha- have grown very wealthy in the tech field and are and own some of the companies that uh, that are working on developing AI have have started to suggest that they they they're also concerned about AI safety. It helps. It gives a little bit of uh, financial support. It helps with uh, overall kind of perception of the field. But at the end of the day, it's science. Opinion on it has no bearing on whatever it's right or wrong. Mm-hmm. So one. Uh... One issue with AI uh, being, a- as you said, uh, something that something that tends to develop at an exponential rate. There's an intuition that as you get a stronger, stronger and stronger AI, your AI can help you to make itself even better to improve on itself, or it can improve things that then cycle back to to helping you improve the system. One issue with that is that the first group to develop an AI uh, would seem to have an instant, you know, the the first mover advantage to the the first AI, superhuman AI developed, it would seem to be huge and potentially problematic. Can you comment on that? Well, I agree completely. Uh, Definitely a lot of extra power if you have that capability but also the same problem can you control your ai are you the first victim hmm. when, whenever there's a an article about about this topic uh journalists like to put a stock photo of of the terminator uh it's it seems like uh it seems like almost a, a a requirement of writing any kind of article about ai is our fictional depictions of, of ai really you know to what extent are they uh, mis- misleading about uh, about this this problem in this field? Well, everyone complains about it, but what would you want them to put on that picture? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Source code, bits, it's the same problem with Bitcoin, right? Every article has this like golden coin 3D printed or something. What are they supposed to do? Crypto signatures? Yeah. Like you're trying to illustrate a point. This is like the only thing every reader will relate to understand and know what it's about uh, i mean i personally don't take it uh, as a huge problem i mean it's not optimal but uh, until someone develops a better image we can share i say just let it be uh if if you had to um if you had to pick a, a fictional depiction of of uh ai or, or of of ai um getting out of control what uh would you would you choose the the Terminator or or something else as as the, your canonical example? Well, let's do some diversity. Ex Machina seems like it would be a better better image. Mm-hmm. So Ex Machina is a movie where a female uh, looking mm-hmm. robot uh, yeah. manages to escape through social engineering attack. Right. The the human characters are uh, are misled. They're uh, they're fooled by the the AI controlled robot into thinking that, well, you know, in, into having some kind of emotional connection with her. Where afterwards, I, I well, uh, without giving too many spoilers, in case people haven't seen the movie, I do recommend it. But 
but she manipulates people and manipulating humans is something something that we worry about AIs learning to do if their utility functions promote it or, or encourage it. Absolutely. We're already seeing it with uh, Facebook algorithms. They manipulate us all the time into staying online, into clicking on things, into changing our mood. So it's it's a huge advantage machines have over us. They can data mine your history, understand what you care about, what your response rates are. Uh, more and more, there is uh, brain imaging involved, uh, trying to reverse engineer how the brain works. So I think they'll be perfect mind hackers in that sense. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about the way the way we expect AI to develop if it's interfacing closely with humans. I think uh you know a lot of a lot of AI are dealing with you know the physical world they're they're you know running factories dealing with mechanical processes whereas other AIs like the one you mentioned uh or the ones you mentioned about you know just algorithms trying to trying to figure out what uh, what YouTube video we want to see next or or what uh you know what ad to feed us um or or uh you know Google Home and Alexa being able to interpret what we say and then give us the information we want it it would seem that uh, some some of these some of these AIs have uh have a lot more feedback with humans have a lot more interaction and have a learning process where the AI learns from the human. The human learns from the AI. Can can you comment on on that process and uh, if there are any concerns about maybe malicious humans uh, manipulate uh, or uh, or just a, a bad relationship between humans and AI learning from one another? All right. So I think we already have examples. For example, Microsoft had the famous Stay Chatbot which was Mm -hmm. supposed to interact with the public and learn from them. Uh, I don't know if you know about it, but it didn't turn out really well for them. Uh, It quickly learned to be abusive, racist, uh, just went completely crazy, insulting. And uh, it's not surprising. You would get that if you expose your training data to just public manipulation. But uh, more generally, you can look at example of children. Uh, Children are growing up with parents, with extended family. Depending on the family they're growing up with, it can go well, it can go not so well. They learn to overgeneralize, they make certain mistakes, they sometimes get abused and grow up to have antisocial tendencies. So a lot uh, can be learned from mistakes and uh, problems we see with uh, childhood development, because essentially... Our artificial neural networks are modeled in the same architecture. They learn in a very similar way. And if they're going to learn from the same data, they're going to fall into the same, same exact patterns. So it's nice that we can predict some of the problems, do this kind of psychoanalysis, and uh, hopefully stop it before it happens. Yeah, yeah. It, it seems with the, the Tay incident, uh, that was a chat bot on Twitter, and uh, you know you could tweet at it and it would... Uh, tweet back to you and uh some unscrupulous people uh on the internet realized that they could manipulate it realized that they could tell it to repeat after me and and say awful terrible things uh and and it seemed like the the real problem there was that the bad actors the people who wanted to embarrass microsoft and and turn tay into a uh, a you know a, a neo Nazi or or you know other say bad things and mean things, they were coordinated. And what Microsoft maybe intended was for everyone you know everyone else was uncoordinated. They maybe the to the extent that other people knew about it, the majority of people weren't trying to make Tay into a Nazi. They probably just interacted with it in normal ways. But uh, but they were uncoordinated, and so it it seems like the uh, Microsoft gave over too much power to 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 a co- the potential to coordinated an attack on their uh, or on their on their AI. 
So I think the main point here is if you're a major company and you don't want to be embarrassed before releasing your product, spend five minutes thinking about, well, how can it backfire? Can someone misuse this technology? How can they hack it? What can be going less than well for us? And that doesn't seem to be like a standard approach right now. Uh, that's that's unfortunate. Uh, but yeah, um, people, the technology is developing very quickly. and so. Uh, there might be a, a tendency to try to release things sooner rather than than uh wait until you can do it uh do it right or do it in a way that uh is less uh less hackable i guess right so i started collecting such examples uh from industry for different products and uh, you can see trends in it you can kind of predict uh, give me a new product and i can kind of guess how it's going to fail and Luckily, some companies starting to show interest in this data, and uh, I get to consult a little bit with uh, smart devices and things like that. So hopefully that will grow. I'll get more examples and we'll be able to better project potential problems. Yeah. Um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, about some of your research. Um, so what what is the idea of AI completeness? So... Some problems are very, very difficult. In fact, they're so difficult, uh, it, it seems like if you can solve it, you can solve all the other problems. And uh, it's an idea from uh, computer science theory, complexity, and different complexity classes. You can break up problems into different difficulty levels. And once you do, if you solve one problem in a class, you can solve all the other problems in that class or below it. So AI complete problems are things like passing Turing test. If mm -hmm. you can pass an unrestricted Turing test, you can do pretty much anything. Another one would be programming. If I can tell you in English, write a program to do X, and you can do that, you can do anything. Mm -hmm. So those are the examples of such problems, and it's essentially saying that the system is generally intelligent. You have to be an AGI to solve an AI complete problem. Right, right. So... So there are certain problems in AI that if you solve them, implicitly you will have solved many, many other problems. You, you, you have uh, an intelligence strong enough to, to answer many, many questions in addition to the, the one you, uh, you set out with, like the, the Turing test and be just being able to convince a human that uh, you as an AI are, are in fact human. Right. You'll be able to solve any problem an average human can solve. Right. Normally, so programming as a job is something that, you know, we hire humans to do and they need special training and they need to be able to, you know, write every line of code in a really specific way. So if a human was able to just say to, to an AI, say, oh, hey, hey, Alexa, program, uh, m make a program that does X, you know, that, that does... Uh, you know, that reminds me when to do my laundry and uh, and updates my schedule for me, I, which I guess is what Alexa already does. But, uh, you know, if, if you could tell a computer to program something else um, without giving it all the specifications uh, the, and the specific specific rules and everything to do in every edge case, that computer would would already be smarter than a human well, at least it'd be as smart as a human at least yes because it would have to sort of build in some I intuitions about okay you know when i say i want the program to do this thing uh does it you know it, it probably means that i don't want it to do this other thing or that in this edge case i probably want to do this um well, we don't want human programmers to make guesses either you want specific mm -hmm. uh answers from the customer but that's not a shortcoming in itself it's the ability to envision the whole product not just you know input output for a single function that's where it becomes general and you have to combine multiple domains understand how they interact and so on but uh but being able to just uh drive a car or or feed you uh suggest suggested videos on on the internet or, or things like that or things that you can do with a, a narrow ai but Part of part of this AI research, it seems, is is just showing what things that you can't really uh, that that can't 
be done with a, a narrow AI. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, tell me, um, uh, so you have a, a paper on uh, arguing that machine ethics is a is a wrong approach to AI safety. Uh, can can you define uh, what what is machine ethics? So for millennia, people tried to come up with an ethical code which would satisfy everyone. And there are religious versions, I don't know, Christian ethics, there are different uh, proposals, utilitarian ethics, uh, consequentialist ethics. Uh, The point of machine ethics is to pick one of those and teach machines to follow it. Since uh, it never worked for humans, we never agreed on one, we never found one which doesn't have backdoors edge cases which are hugely problematic it doesn't seem like that's a solution just simply going okay we're gonna instantiate this ethical code a lot of times people propose their own version like bob's ethics and publish a paper and there are dozens of those and like yes bob's ethics is what we want to do it doesn't seem like it's a solution Uh, it doesn't seem like it's going to scale or work so i just kind of in general don't suggest more people publishing such papers right so so the idea is the idea of machine ethics is you you take an ethical code, you know, maybe it's utilitarianism or well, maybe not utility, but you know, maybe maybe it's virtue ethics or or uh or some kind of uh you know, you poll a bunch of humans and and get what their ethical beliefs are and then you try to program uh, an AI to have to follow that code of ethics. And you're saying that's not a good approach. Right. But that's basically a democratic election for a super intelligent dictator. Mm. Which is problematic. Uh, explain why that's problematic. Well, once you make those decisions, you first of all will not get a 100% majority, right? You'll have disagreements. So some people from the get go don't get what they wanted. And it's exactly what we see in democracy. Half the country is disappointed, right? No matter who gets elected. But uh, at least uh, these people die. Four years later, we have another chance. This is a a little more permanent, right? If you install this into a system which is running the world, it's immortal, it's uh, very powerful. That's uh, a very difficult situation. On the other hand, if you make it uh, grow with you, learn, dynamically adapt and change, it's possible it will grow in directions you also don't want to support and happy with. So the things we do right now, I can easily tell you how to make us more ethical. But I think forcing the whole society to follow my more ethical guidelines will be hugely problematic. So uh, what what alternative would would be superior to uh, to uh, a machine ethics approach to AI safety? So again, you're asking me, what is the solution to AI safety problem? Oh yeah, I, I, <laughs> I suppose we we don't know, but I guess uh, just uh, what what. So I I suppose then a lot of the research is eliminating candidate solutions or or showing why they're they're problematic. Exactly, that's exactly what uh, I'm hoping to accomplish at this point. Yeah, and and just uh, just to uh, to identify. Which paths are are not are are not uh, fruitful or or not going to be fruitful, and by process of elimination, well, some are much worse mm-hmm. than others. Some problems are just uh, some possible solutions are just obviously so much worse. Yeah. It's obvious they are not dominated, but uh, uh, it helps to see. Okay, can this scale? Maybe this works for AI systems we have today, but it has no chance of dealing with something as smart as a human. So, okay, that's a good uh, short-term patch. We can use that now, but what about next level? And that's the interesting part. Yeah. What what do you think of uh, Nick Bostrom's idea to build AIs that are only capable of uh, answering questions? So Oracle AIs are a useful tool, and I think we'll have it as some sort of intermediate step uh, in the process of building superintelligent systems. But of course, if somebody gives you advice, they essentially make decisions for you, they control you. And if they can make projections many, many steps ahead of you where some trivial, maybe insignificant uh, advice may lead you to situations you don't want to be in. So I think such a system could be just as dangerous long term. 
Right, right. So you you can be manipulated. And so the the idea of an AI that only answers your questions, I think in in the ideal case, it the idea is if it starts telling you things that you think are are not so good, uh, if it gives you uh, advice that is obviously going to uh, lead to some bad outcome or violate your ethics, you can just choose not to follow it. But uh, but that's um, that's problematic, is what you're saying. What I'm saying is you will not know that it's problematic. You'll think it's perfectly good advice, and then you'll get another piece of advice and another, and after three or four of those, you realize you completely screwed at this point and can't undo the damage done. Right. So it, it, can, it can trick you, it can manipulate you, it could give you advice that it knows you're not going to follow uh, with the intention of affecting your behavior in some other way. It could in, be in the same tricky, way that yes, absolutely mm-hmm. it can have side effects so maybe it gives you an advice which is somewhat reasonable for the problem but has a huge side effect you don't even know about not aware of right and you know we we see this with you know an a, adult can easily uh, or adults often manipulate children you know you if you if you can you know, you can use re- reverse psychology on your five-year-old and and convince them to to do something that you really wanted them to do. And in terms of an AI with a uh, with maybe a, a bigger gap between its intel its intelligence, its uh, processing capability, and and yours than than the gap between you and your five-year-old, it could do the same thing. I think that's exactly the issue. Yes. All right. So. Things are AI is uh, a big field. You have a lot of companies working towards it, building smarter AIs all the time. So far, they're all narrow. They're, uh, uh, but they're getting better. They're getting more general. We're seeing AIs that can do more things uh, and more and things that we previously thought only humans could do. And and yet, AI, AI safety is is still in its infancy. Do do you see the the technology growing uh, faster than than the uh, the ideas about how to control it? Is is that a realistic um, outcome that uh, that we just forge ahead building building bigger and bigger AIs before we figured out uh, figured out how to uh, handle them? Well, I think for a while that's going to happen, but as we have more and more accidents failures and they become more impactful i think people will start to realize what the problems are a lot more so when something like uh, tay chatbot happens i mean it's going viral in the news but nobody like is threatened by it okay you called me bad names who cares but then uh, multiple people get injured or killed in an accident more and more people will start paying attention so in a way, the technology as its side effect will kind of educate about importance of safety. Right. Um, and I mean, we we already see some of that when, when there's an accident involving a self-driving car. But it, it seems like, uh, you know, from my perspective, people overreact to those accidents because a, a self-driving car... Well, for one thing, it has to be compared to the alternative of a human driver, and human drivers make uh, fatal mistakes all the time, potentially more so than self-driving cars. We'll see when uh, when uh, there's a bigger rollout of uh, of autonomous vehicles. But the thing about a self-driving car is the worst it can do is, uh, at least the worst it can do is create isolated events. You know, the f- a five-car pileup or a you know head-on collision or driving off a cliff but ultimately since we're worried more about existential risk we're we should be more worried about any something where everyone can be killed or or where uh where a big where the ai controls something so systemically important that it can create a a problem for all of society not just an individual problem at at one particular intersection or or stretch of highway. 
Right, I agree with you. Self-driving cars are already safer than humans. The reason we see a story about a single person killed in a car accident is because it's by a self-driving car. We don't hear 50,000 stories like that every year about human drivers. It's not newsworthy. So I agree mm -hmm. with uh, that part, but I'm kind of looking forward. Okay, so let's say we are successful. We deploy a fleet of self-driving cars. They have, I don't know, 50% of a market, and then there is a bug or a hack, and 100,000 accidents mm. happen at the same time, synchronized. Right. So and that, that's, that could... I think, going to have a lot more impact in terms of emphasizing we released something where it was not verified sufficiently well. Right. So not only would that potentially kill... Uh, you know, all the people in those cars and the, you know, maybe people nearby them that they crash into could shut down infrastructure and make it hard for, you know, for sick people to get medicine and maybe certain areas wouldn't be able to to get fresh water. And it, it could then create a much larger problem if uh, by being by having all the errors happen at once. Whereas yeah, because we there's centralize no... our code. Mm -hmm. The same program is accessible yeah. to billions of people now. So if there is a mistake, it impacts so many people. It used to be very localized. Okay, your computer had an issue. It's no longer the case. Right. That, that's that's sort of a, a, a... There's an analogy here to uh, one of the reasons it's nice to have a free market or you know a decentralized kind of economy is that... Uh, one person's mistakes generally don't propagate to to everyone else whereas if you you know if you're in the soviet union and uh the the commissar of one particular industry makes a bad call then you know the you have a by centralizing no power you create yeah exactly <laughs> uh, there there's a, a one decision one bad decision by by someone in control of an entire industry or an entire country can be a much bigger problem even if their average level of decision making might be higher than the average decision making in a decentralized kind of system are are there thoughts of of how to uh of maybe uh making ai safer by by making it smaller scale or more more idiosyncratic having lots of disconnected ais as opposed to one big centralized or or many networked ones there is work on uh, kind of creating competing AIs and seeing how that works out. Of course, that creates possibilities for them competing in a non-healthy adversarial ways. Uh, I also feel there is some use for creating restricted AIs. So just because we're capable of making a super intelligent system doesn't mean we have to. If we can put restrictions on its capability in terms of number of steps it can compute, uh, amount of memory it has access to, and so on, it might be beneficial in certain domains. So that's an area of research we call artificial stupidity. And essentially, we can study what limits people have, what limits humans have in terms of their memory, in terms of their capability to compute, uh, different biases they have. And if we can instill the same problems in, uh, for example, a uh, household robot, then in certain ways it would be an advantage because they can better relate and less likely to be too powerful for the situation they're in. So right now our AIs are narrow because that's the only way we know to build them. But in the future, maybe once we're able to build a much more, more general, more powerful AI, we might want to keep them narrow by design. Right, you don't want your toaster to be the smartest thing in the world. It just doesn't help oh, yeah. with anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, yeah. So you you may want a toaster that uh, predicts when you're going to wake up in the morning, so you have toast ready for you. You you don't want a toaster that is networked with all of the uh, all of the systems all over the world in a way that could. Uh, could do something beyond your uh, your capability to stop or understand. Right, uh, just enough intelligence to to perform the function. Yeah, and of course, uh, the AIs may not want to be uh, restricted. You'd have to kind of you couldn't build an AI, and then it, it might be difficult to build an AI and then restrict it 
after problems arise. It it may not as as you mentioned earlier, building one of the challenges is building AIs that are willing to accept being updated or changed or or even turned off by humans. So we may want to build the limitations in before activating the super intelligent AI so that it can't uh you know it can't stop us from uh from hobbling it. All right, so you have to build in some sort of handicaps before you can take a super intelligent system and try to reduce it. It will probably not work well. Mhm. Because, you know, whatever whatever's in its utility function probably uh you know being being restricted being limited uh uh is is going to reduce its ability to to maximize that so implicit in uh you know in a poorly defined utility function or in in, in a utility function that's not perfectly aligned with human goals is <laughs> is a desire to to continue running and to continue running at full uh full capacity full intelligence Right. Uh, also, I'm very much interested in research on malevolent, purposeful design of dangerous systems. And if you have a product mm. which is very benign, but has capabilities you can unlock, which makes it industrial grade uh, military AI or something like that, then there are people who would do that. So you shouldn't build that capability in that same same project, same product to begin with. Right. Uh, you know, we, humans may deliberately design AIs to harm their enemies, uh, which, uh, you know, a, lo- a lot of the AI stories are we, we build an AI to, to do something benign and it's, and it hurts us. But of course, if we build an AI to hurt someone else, and then it ends up hurting us, that that's a, a much, a much smaller leap, uh, from something already designed to be harmful to, to just be more harmful. So that's a big part of my research. Most people in AI safety only concentrate on uh, kind of misalignment of values, bugs in the code, poor design, whereas I see purposeful, malevolent design as the biggest problem. It contains all the other issues, but also has this additional malevolent payload, and there is really nothing you can do to stop someone from engaging in such behavior, at least. We haven't found a solution yet. So we're we're, uh, coming to the end of our time uh do, do you have any closing thoughts any uh any sort of general takeaways that you'd like the audience to have uh for after hearing this conversation so it depends on who you are if you are a person developing ai products smart products uh, definitely start with safety in mind you don't want to embarrass your employer you don't want to cause problems for people so kind of spend some time brainstorming what possibly can go wrong how can you protect from that how can you improve on your design so it cannot be misused by uh, malevolent actors hackers Uh, if you just general audience kind of pay attention to the state of the art in this technology there is a good chance it will impact your employment if you're a student selecting a college major, make sure it's not something we'll be able to automate before you graduate or soon after. So it really depends on who you are. We have a lot of good papers, uh, books coming out on this subject. Uh, educate yourself. All right. Uh, my guest today has been Roman Yampolsky. Roman, thanks for being part of Economics Detective Radio. Thank you so much for inviting me. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Economics Detective Radio. The discussion question for today is, what's your biggest concern with AI in the near or even far future? You can choose from one of the topics we discussed in this episode, or you can raise uh, another concern if you have a concern we didn't talk about. We'll be discussing that question at Economics Detective. It's a group on Facebook titled Economics Detective. It's a closed group, so you can go and request to join, answer a few questions, and then contribute to the discussion. Thanks for listening, and I will be back next week.